So let's take a deep dive into one epilepsy subtype, absence epilepsy. In fact, this EEG that's in this, or the stylized EEG that's in the background here is the EEG of someone experiencing an absence seizure. So hopefully I've inserted a little video somewhere around here of a, a child having an absence event. But absence seizures in a way are, unless they're incredibly um, frequent are not that detrimental to somebody's life. In fact, a lot of children who have absence epilepsy are accused of just being um, of showing poor attention, or you know, occasionally their parents think they have something like ADHD uh, because really it it often involves just a you know ten second, thirty second burst of what looks like on the outside. Uh, inattention. But what it is, is a complete, nearly always a complete loss of consciousness. And that's what made me so interested um, in it was that when I started being interested in absence epilepsy, everybody thought that, you know, seizures were caused by a small miswiring in some bit of the brain. Some bit of the brain was sort of broken. Well, the thing that it, it seems or seemed to be the case in absence epilepsy was that it was the brain going into some abnormal rhythm, some abnormal pattern of activity, and then snapping back out of it. And there was no, no other features apart from this loss of consciousness. So basically, what absence epilepsy was doing was turning the switch of consciousness on and off. So I thought if we could understand more about that, uh, maybe we could get a better handle on consciousness. Now, I don't think that anymore because the problem is that actually absence epilepsy does something to pretty much the entire brain. So all it really tells you is that the brain needs to function normally in order for you to have consciousness. But still, it is a relatively common disease of childhood. Uh, and um, so it has it has a, a significant health burden, and let's try and have a look to see what we know about what's going on. So this is a real EEG of somebody having an uh, absence event. This one goes for about 10 seconds, and what we see are this very specific EEG hallmark, the spike and wave. So we have the spike in the middle and the wave sort of going around it. Now, some of these look more spike and wavy than others, but, you know, this is like EEG reading 101 that is very easy to recognize. You can see it's completely generalized. It's in both hemispheres. It's across all electrodes, right? The the whole brain is is essentially doing this. Frontal areas more than um, than occipital areas, but... You know, this is not restricted really to, to any cortex. This is the whole brain doing it. And you only get these spike in waves during loss of consciousness. And if you have a loss of consciousness, you have these spike in waves. So they're sufficient and necessary for the uh, absence event. So nearly, yeah, nearly all genetic absence epilepsy, Mendelian um, absence epilepsy is associated with the CAV 3.2 protein, which is the which is a T-type calcium channel that's in the brain, and it is found um, everywhere. Um, that is T-type calcium channels, but most notably uh, in the thalamus. So here we have the expression of these three channels in the mouse brain, and you can see for the CAV 3.1, this is the thalamus down here. This round here, CAV 3.2, is expressed in this band here, as is CAV 3.3. Although you can see it's expressed in other regions, not purely in the thalamus. But we're going to talk about the thalamus a lot, so, you know, be prepared, right? And, and, and hopefully we can remember that the thalamus is what sends these uh, thalamocortical inputs to the, to the cortex. They receive the input from the... the primary senses apart from olfaction, but also layer six of the cortex projects back to the same nuclei, the relay nuclei, the, the first order nuclei, the sense, primary sensory nuclei, while layer five projects to higher order 
uh, thalamic th nuclei. These are ones that don't get their direct input from a, um, a, a sensory region. And, and so we sort of, this is this canonical thalamocortical loop, but something that is often left out of this is that there is something called the reticular nucleus. You see, in most regions of the brain, not all, but most, there's a mixture of excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. The cortex is a great example of that, but you'll see that in, in, a variety, in a collection of other regions, right? But in the thalamus, that's not the case. The, or basically not the case. Nearly every single neuron in there is a corticothalamic neuron, and there are no inhibitory interneurons. What there is, is this reticular nucleus. The reticular nucleus was that little shell, that little line on the outside of the thalamus. And this is where all of the inhibitory neurons for the thalamus sit. Now, the, uh, the reticular nucleus that I'm going to largely be calling the NRT, the, which is like the, the Latin version of it, the, the nuclei reticuli, reticularis th thalami, um, just because I got used to calling it that, uh, even though that's a silly name for it. <laughs> um, it, it gets its input from neurons in layer six, primarily. But it also, it also gets um, its input to a lesser extent from the uh, primary sensory nuclei, right? So it's, it's sitting here, the, basically the inhibitory neurons for the, the thalamus, and it gets input from um, sort of, you could call it feed, feed forward excitation from the thalamus. If we think about it from the thalamic point of view, sensory information comes in, it excites the corticothalamic neurons, sorry, the thalamocortical neurons, they excite the reticular nucleus, which comes back and inhibits. But you also see that once the cortex has been excited, then layer six travels back and it uh, drives the NRT neurons as well as the relay neurons. Okay, so just hold that in your, your mind for a little bit. So this is going to seem a little off base, but just take me, just to, let's just go with it for the, a little bit, right? So there are these things called sleep spindles, and sleep spindles are these very pronounced EEG waveforms seen in non-REM sleep, right? So we see them in the mice, the rat, the cats, the human, basically every every mammal uh, produces them. Now, this is a raw sleep um, waveform at the top. This is what you'd really record off the surface, but if you do a little filtering to just reveal the signals between 10 to 15 hertz, then you see these sleep spindles, and you actually start to see, oh, hang on, these are sort of everywhere. Um, and so Stereata, who is, who well, was this incredibly important neuroscientist, showed that they were generated in the TRN. Um, so Basically, if you destroyed the TRN, the, the animal couldn't generate these sleep spindles. And if you just have a slice of the TRN, it will generate oscillations, you know, electrical activity that looks just like this. Now, of course, this EEG is being recorded from the surface of the scalp. So this shows that the TRN is probably almost certainly modulating the activity of the thalamus, and then it's those thalamocortical neurons that are being affected that produce the sleep spindle in the cortex. Now, there's a lot about sleep spindles. There's a lot of interesting things happen during sleep spindles, um, but we'll just leave right now that these are a well-known, defined EEG rhythm that is generated by the thalamocortical corticothalamic pathway and primarily, or importantly, crucially by the TRN. Now, um, what was revealed was, as it says, 1993, a collection of papers doing really quite impressive experiments, even by today's standard, um, showed the cellular mechanism of the sleep spindle. So here is a sleep spindle recorded by, they call it depth EEG, but it's, it's a local field potential. Here's a recording from a cortical cell, and as I've t told you a million times, right, you only see EEG signals, EEG signals when there is synchronous activity. So you see these the spike in this one cell, this is an intracellular recording, during the um, the downward phase of the, the sleep spindle. And of course, there must then be dozens or hundreds of other neurons spiking at the exact same time. 
right? So every time that there is a sleep, sp there is a spike in the sleep spindle, there is a, a true action potential. Now, if you look at the a thalamocortical cell, you see that the thalamocortical cell is firing exactly prior to the cortical cell firing. So the, the thalamocortical cell is sending its axons up to the cortex and driving these. And then if we look in the NRT, we see that these inhibitory neurons are firing exactly in the low point of the TC cell, of the thalamocortical cell. So we have this pattern where it's basically going, TC cells are active, then um, the cortical cells are active, then in the gap between these two, we get the NRT cell active. And what is going on is that basically these TC cells, these thalamocortical cells, have a behavior where if they're strongly inhibited, which is going to happen when the NRT cells fire these bursts of action potentials, when that inhibition is removed, the TC cells generate something called a low threshold spike which is what we see here. In fact, here is a pure low threshold spike with no action potential on top, but uh, most of them have an action potential on top. So what is a low threshold spike? Sometimes it's called rebound excitation. It's got lots of funny names in old literature, but we call it a low threshold spike. And seeing as I kind of figured out how they work, I, I get to call it what I want, right? So the low threshold spike is um, a pretty well-defined uh, thing now. So basically, T-type calcium channels. You can think of a T-type calcium channel as a lot like a classical voltage-gated sodium channel, right? You depolarize them a little bit, the channel's open, that causes more calcium to flood in, that polarizes the cell more, more T-channels open, then eventually they inactivate if they're depolarized for too long, uh, and the membrane potential comes back down. The only difference is that all of the voltage dependences are shifted in easy 20 millivolts in the hyperpolarized direction. So at rest, when the cell is at rest, all of the T-type calcium channels are inactivated. So if you want to activate them, what you have to do is hyperpolarize the cell. That removes the inactivation, and then when you let the cell return to the resting membrane potential, then all the T-channels open, the, they depolarize the cell, and if there's voltage-gated sodium channels available, it depolarizes enough for for action potentials to occur on occur on the top. Then the T channels inactivate, and the cell returns to met, rest. So that's exactly what we see here, right? A cell sitting at rest, nothing happening. The cell is hyperpolarized by current being injected into it, and when they turn off the current, instead of the cell just going back to rest like any normal cell would. Those T channels now open because they were, have been deinactivated by being hyperpolarized, depolarizes the cell, you get some true sodium action potentials on top, and the cell goes back to rest. So when we look at these sleep spindles, now we can kind of understand what's going on. That that here we see these huge IPSPs. These are caused by the NRT cells being heavily active, inhibiting the uh, t the the TC cell, did I say that right? The NRT cells are hugely active, they inhibit the TC cell, then you get the low threshold spike, which makes the cell spike, and then you get that drives the cortical cells to be depolarized. And some of these then are depolarized enough that they send a signal back to the um, NRT neurons, which is roughly coincident with the, the input from the thalamocortical cells, that excites the the NRT neurons, which then inhibit the TC neuron again, and so as that inhibition then wanes, the cell spikes, okay? Now, I know I've gone into a lot of detail here, but my the, the real, I mean, A, I think this is pretty fascinating that this is sort of a biological um, resonance, a real resonance system, you know, like a, like a swinging um, clock arm, right, that it, 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 this sort of system almost wants to generate these oscillations because it's been tuned in that way. But the real point here that I'm trying to get across is here is a almost self-generating oscillation, you know, where one cell makes the other cell be active, which feeds back to the first cell, and it just goes round and round and round. That's an interesting question. Why does it stop, right? Once it starts, how does it ever stop? We're not going to get into that. Um, but the, the, the point is that this, this self-exciting resonance system exists in the brain. 
So this has led to a sort of a long-standing idea that the spike in wave is just some perversion of this sleep spindle, okay? Now, what are some of the facts that support this? Well, we know that because the sleep spindle is absolutely dependent on T-type calcium channel function, this fits with the idea that um, absence epilepsy is often associated with mutations in that same channel. Um, GABA B receptor agonists, the, the recreational drug GHB and the clinical drug baclofen can both induce absence seizures uh, when given orally or intravenously or when injected directly into the thalamus. And these hyperpolarized thalamic neurons, that's what GABA B receptors do, remember they open potassium channels and hyperpolarize the cell, so that makes low threshold spikes possible. And there's a collection of other things that sort of uh, implicate this whole system. But the big, big problem is that sleep spindles um, are occur at 10 times a second, while spike and waves occur at three times a second. So, you know, if the spike and wave was 10 hertz, I think people would have decided this was solved long ago. But the fact that the frequency is very different has led to a lot of problems. So, you know, what is going on? You know, instead of looking at the sleep spindle and saying, oh, that's kind of reminiscent of a, of a, of a spike and wave, um, let's look at what there is. Now, thankfully, there's a collection of um, rodents with absence epilepsy, uh, genetic absence epilepsy. Some of them are very, very, the, the effects are very, similar to human absence epilepsy. The mice ones aren't. Uh, I've done most of my work, unfortunately, in stargazer mice, but the, these these gears and the wag ridge mice, uh, rats, are have very human-looking absence epilepsy in terms of the EEG, in terms of they undergo behavioral arrest, which is fancy words for they look like they lose consciousness. Um, so yeah, a lot of the best work is done in these. And so what do we see, right? Well, here is the EEG spike and wave discharge in a gears rat. And when we look, um, well, here are, here's two thalamocortical neurons, here's two NRT neurons. Well, we don't see, don't see a hell of a lot, to be honest with you, you know? Maybe the TC neurons appear to become silent or a little bit more silent. Here's, here's another one, uh, you know. There you go, a little bit less silent, uh, but it's, not, it's nothing quite like sort of the rhythmic behavior we'd hoped. And so when you um, look, what you basically see is that on the, so these graphs show um, burst firing and tonic firing and total firing. Let's just look at the th total firing is what you see is, well, very little total change in the firing rate. There's something going on. Obviously, the red lines mark the start and the end of the absence seizure. And so you sort of see that the NRT neurons or the TRE neurons become less active and then slightly more active. You see the TC neurons become slightly less active. When you look at the tonic firing, so the ones just firing one exponential at a time, there is a significant reduction. Um, but, you know, nothing, nothing amazing. But um, this finding is important. So TTAP2 blocks T-type calcium channels. And when you uh, apply TTAP2 into the um, thalamocortical neurons, it doesn't stop the seizures. But when you apply it to the TRN neurons, it does stop the seizures, right? So burst firing, that is to say these low threshold spikes in the TRN neurons is crucial for the generation of absence seizures. Uh, so what can we tell from that? Well, the first thing that we need to you guys need to learn, and a lot of people who are in this field need to rem remember, is that the spike in wave discharge does not start in the thalamus, right? Despite all this evidence that it's male, well, it's probably a thalamocortical rhythm, you see the EEG happen in the cortex first, and then it spreads 
to the thalamus, right? So here, this is a second or two before we start to see the EEG pattern in the thalamus. And in fact, you can get a spike and wave occurring just in the cortex and not going to the thalamus. So what it seems is that, oh, and it's worth pointing out that when that does happen uh, in humans, you do not get a loss of consciousness. So what it appears to be is that the cortex is in fact the true generator of this, but in order for the spike and wave discharge to go on for longer and to lead to the loss of consciousness, it needs to recruit the thalamocortical system. Right, so we still don't truly know what's going on here, but we know that bursting in the NRT neurons is important. Um, there's one big question in this, which is sort of, I'm not going to get in, that, that we still don't know whether NRT neurons inhibit each other, right? Um, and so you'd think this would be an easy question to answer. Uh, it's often difficult to prove that something doesn't happen. Uh, and a lot of very influential people said that they do. But the question is, what makes the NRT neurons burst? Now, it could be cortical input makes the NRT neurons burst. That seems a bit confusing because they should they need to be hyperpolarized. Um, but maybe somehow they can burst by themselves. And then that leads to inhibition of the thalamocortical cells. And that uh, then is what leads to the loss of consciousness. But again, you know, this highlights this idea that thinking about seizures as just too much activity or too too little activity is not a useful way of thinking about it. It's all about the timing and the rhythm and the pattern of 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 the cell firing that decides whether this is a truly pathological brain activity or maybe just some slightly unusual activity, which is to say, if the if 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 the activity is not doesn't doesn't have the right rhythm it's not going to cause motor problems it's not going to cause loss of consciousness it may still be pathological right in the fact that it's unusual that it's it's not seen in people without epilepsy but so long as it doesn't cause a seizure it's not really a problem so we we need to start thinking about you know the pattern of activity that happens during a seizure rather than just too much firing too little firing 